Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. Blue skies. Sunshine. Sunshine. What a day. Let's take a walk in love. Brownsville, come on. Bed Stock, come on. Fort Green, come on. Everybody, come on. Queensbridge, come on. South Bronx, come on. Uptown, come on. Everybody, come on. Let's take a walk through the deepest part of the hood. I want to know who it was. Hi, everyone, and welcome to week two of CRIM 210. For this week, students need to check the syllabus to make sure they're up to date with the week's readings and then I recommend if you haven't already learned how to navigate Canvas just get on Canvas play around make sure you find everything make sure you're able to find the course lectures obviously they're on YouTube and media site make sure you can find the syllabus on Canvas and importantly the discussion sections on Canvas for this week there will be a discussion posted by and facilitated by your TA and then you'll also need to sign up for your I don't want to say term paper because there's kind of like three short essays and you get to pick which of those essays you're going to present and you have to decide which week you're going to present that essay in and you can find the sign up sheet on Canvas under the discussion sections. And then the last thing that you need to do if you haven't already done so is log in to the discussion section and just introduce yourself. Uh, to your tutorial group. Again, this is an online class, so it's not like we have those traditional tutorials, but we do have these discussion groups that you will be using to engage in discussions about the course. So for week two, we'll be taking a look at the history of how not just Canada, but the world has viewed youth. And in fact, in agrarian societies, we'll see that there was really no conceptualization of youth or adolescence. Children and adolescents were just viewed as miniature adults and there was no necessarily sort of separation of age stages. And if you're really interested in this type of topic, I definitely recommend taking a look at the book Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Noel Hawari. Uh, it's a really interesting look at basically how humans have evolved and how humans have lived during different eras and different age stages. And some of the lecture today will kind of focus on things that he has talked about. So talking about childhood and adolescence as distinct developmental stages is something that is kind of a risk phenomenon. And uh, Homo sapiens have been around for about five 50,000 years, yet we've only really distinguished between developmental stages within humans in maybe the last 100 years. So 50,000 years and it took us 49,900 to begin to understand that there are clear developmental differences between children and adolescents, between adolescents and early adulthood, and even now we're understanding that there are differences between emerging adults, so with that age 18 to 25 period, and more mature adults, so after age 25. And the reason why we set 25 as kind of this additional threshold is because we tend to believe that brain development and personality become more fixed after age 25. So we, for youth and adolescence in Canada, we tend to focus on ages 12 to 17 as one developmental stage, and then ages 18 to 23, ages 18 to 25 is this emerging adulthood stage where I would say that between ages 18 to 25, individuals are more similar to adolescents than ages you know, 35, 40 years old, specifically in terms of brain development, personality, and things like that. So certainly I'm not saying that 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, people didn't recognize children as children. They definitely did in terms of a cultural concept of raising children, these are my offspring, and so on. But there wasn't really a recognition of childhood and adolescence as biological concepts and what these developmental stages actually mean in terms of biology. In the early 1900s, all the way up to about 2010, we had this understanding that adolescence was definitely different from adulthood. But we were really thinking about adolescence more in terms of how society views that person and not really in terms of what that person is actually like. Since sort of more the turn of the 21st century, especially 2015 and onwards, 2010 and onwards, 
we begin to recognize adolescence as a distinct biological age stage and not just a reflection of how society views that particular person. So we're now using things like brain imaging technology to recognize it. These individuals' brains are still developing. They look different. They function differently compared to the brain of an adult. And this is another major reason why we need to have a separate youth justice system. So the lecture themes today are going to focus on historical perspectives on youth and societal views of youth in general. We'll talk a little bit about youth in Canada, including how youth were viewed in Canada, how Canada initially saw youth involved in antisocial, delinquent, or criminal behavior. And we'll talk a little bit about historical responses to youth crime. What's important to understand in this class is that delinquent behavior, antisocial behavior, and criminal behavior are not actually describing the same thing. All criminal behaviors are antisocial behaviors, but not all antisocial behaviors are criminal behaviors. Delinquent behaviors are typically referring to something that is specific only to the youth age stage, like skipping school, what's commonly known as truancy, or incorrigibility, which means not listening to parents. Drinking could be an example of a delinquent behavior. So delinquent behaviors tend to be behaviors that we see as wrong, or not we, but some parts of society see as wrong for adolescents, but not wrong for adults. So we'll begin with historical perspectives on youth, starting all the way from the Middle Ages to the period of Enlightenment. Now don't worry, for the midterm, for the exam, forgot there, or I've gotten rid of the midterm exam, but for the final exam, there will be no questions about specific dates. I don't find this memorization useful, but what's also true is that history doesn't work in a way where we see that there's a trend and then one year and the trend stops. So it's not as if kids were viewed as miniature adults from the 400s to the 1600s. And in 1601, the perspective changed. In history, we see slow transitions out of ideas and into new ideas. We don't see the entire world change on a beat. We are seeing change happen more swiftly because of things like the internet that can help transmit new ideas so we can see the process of change happen faster but there is no like one single date that represents massive change in terms of how society views youth. So what I want you to get out of this lecture is understand the process of change. Understand the general era that I'm talking about and how youth were viewed within that particular era. Just on another note, I'll put slides up here so that you can uh, see the slides, but it's not meant for you to like read off the slide. You're not meant, it's just telling you which slide I'm now talking about. Try to learn how to take efficient notes. It's not note taking if you're writing down every single thing that I've said or every single point that's on the slide. The purpose of note taking is for students to be able to take a large body of information and identify what is most important. This is, you're only going to learn this with practice. And that's the goal of this class is to not just give you a list of notes on a slide and tell you that this is what you need to know. We're trying to build skills. And one of these skills is the ability to identify key versus not key information. So we'll start with the Middle Ages perspective on youth. And this will cover medieval Europe in around the 5th to the 14th century, so from the 600s to the 1500s. Under this perspective, the viewpoint was that children were born evil, and this was linked to original sin. So going all the way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and eating the apple, and that's where humans were initially viewed as, okay, they're innately bad. Humans are born with sin, they're born with this evilness, and we need to weed the evilness out of people. So this sounds like in a very extreme perspective, but here's why I love talking about history, is that we can see these historical perspectives have influence on contemporary theories. So we'll talk a little bit in this class in a few weeks about control theories. Control theories try to explain what has to happen 
for somebody to not engage in crime. So this perspective is almost taking a similar viewpoint as original sin. It's not linked, excuse me, original sin. It's not linking things to demonic possession or anything like that, but it is saying that humans are kind of born problematized and that different things have to happen to make sure that they don't go on to engage in criminal behavior. What we saw during this era is the predominance of the Catholic Church over all facets of life. It wasn't as if there was this church and then there was a state, we had the economy, we had uh, agricultural perspectives, we had education ministers, not like Canada's you know, different ministries and departments today. The Roman Catholic Church was the economy. It was the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Finance. It was everything, including presiding over how to respond to persons involved in crime. So at this point in time, the Catholic Church viewed children as miniature adults. There was no need to separate children from adults in terms of a unique developmental stage. So there wasn't a lot of writings, obviously, at this time. The 90%, 95% of people did not know how to read or write. But artwork can tell us the story of how youth were viewed at this point in time. During this time period, one of the best indicators of how age didn't matter is that age was never recorded in official documents. We think now about how the focus will be on when somebody was born, when somebody died, at what age they accomplished these different things. In the medieval ages, people didn't even record the age somebody was when they passed away. There was the ideas of birth dates, milestones, these things were not actually applicable to this age stage. Artwork is really useful for telling the story of how youth were viewed during this era. One of the things to, or key terms to know when talking about the Roman Catholic Church was that they had hegemonic power over society. So what does hegemonic mean? It essentially means that the church has total control over the flow of information, that there is no alternative perspective to the church. The church communicates information to people and people consume that information. And that's the only way that information is transmitted. Society got their knowledge from the church and from nowhere else. So you can see a lot of odd pictures in this slide here. You've got different photos of kids that are dressed like adults. They're in stiff clothing, stiff postures, they're not playing, they're not doing anything other than sitting. And so the idea here is that children are just viewed as these miniature adults. They're being raised to become the adult that they're viewed as. In some of these pictures, you can see one common theme, which is that they're all holding birds, which is meant to represent uh, innocence. That's in artwork, birds sometimes represent purity or innocence. And so this can be an example of how there was some shift in the perspective of adolescence at that time. Instead of viewing them as born with original sin, some were viewing children as pure and innocent and maybe this helped see a transition away from the view of these individuals as miniature adults, and rather instead as individuals who are naturally innocent and need to be raised properly by adults. The next era that we'll talk about after the Middle Ages is the Reformation era from the 14th to the 16th century, where we see a decline of the Roman Catholic Church specifically in terms of judicial power and philosophy. This doesn't mean that the Roman Catholic Church declined in other ways. Everybody still believed in the Catholic Church. We began to see the Catholic Church's grasp on the judicial power and sort of rule over criminal behavior begin to decline. We saw this Puritan doctrine where children were born evil and stubborn and had to be civilized towards destiny or virtue, virtue and salvation. So again, at this time still, we hadn't moved to that corruption phase of society ruining the purity of adolescence and children, but we are beginning to see the shift away from the Catholic Church. We see harsh and restrictive child rearing practices as the best way to like tame the child's wild behavior. So children that did go to school 
were sort of viewed as disobedient and schoolmasters would beat these children as a way to teach them to no longer be disobedient, to try and tame the wild child. Just because the Roman Catholic Church wasn't also acting as the court system, it did obviously promote religion and morality and this had an influence on how people viewed the best way to raise children to make sure that they were self-reliant and had self-control. So one thing that the Reformation period is known for is the rise of the Protestant church and the Protestant epic. And we'll see in sort of the initial origins of European settlement in Canada that the Protestant doctrine, the Protestant ethic really influenced how the judicial system responded to youth. We actually see, so in the, we see a shift in power from the Catholic Church to the Protestant Church. This sort of divide between the Protestant Church and the Catholic Church and persons that identified as Catholic versus Protestant resulted in the judicial system mainly targeting Catholic kids to include them in the justice system or put place them into reform schools. A really important person to know, to understand how we began to see a further shift away from the hegemonic control of the Roman Catholic Church is Johannes Gutenberg. Gutenberg is really important because he developed the printing press and this allowed for information to be disseminated in a much wider scale. People could write and disseminate this information to others. So no longer could the church dictate how people would receive information. Another reason for why the printing press was so important is that it then allowed instructions to be created to do specific jobs. And what people began to realize was that it took individuals until about the age of seven to actually be able to read this information. So we slowly begin to see where this idea of childhood and adolescence begins. These stages began to sort of demarcate when individuals were able to work and when individuals were not able to work, not just because of physical abilities, but actually because of their ability to read and understand instruction. Age of discovery perspective that took place around the 16th to 17th century saw a very slow change in Western Europe in terms of a move from agrarian feudalism. So people lived on farms, they worked as serfs. These, this land that they farmed was owned by a lord or somebody else other than them. Nobody owned their own land. To mercantilism, where there was usually meant there was a single corporation passed down or dictated by the government or the church that was responsible for running a particular business or a particular enterprise. And during this stage, poverty was rampant. Delinquency became a growing problem. There was a new class of young vagrants and beggars, and some viewed this as a sort of a loss of the agrarian roots. It used to be that family was more closely knit, but because they would work together on the farms and things like that, but when we move towards this mercantilism and towards this industrial revolution, children's labor is no longer needed. Children used to work, for example, as apprentices and they would carry water for workers in the fields and this would give them something to do. As technology advanced and as work became a little bit more requiring skill or working in factories, children were not necessarily needed anymore. And so, that means that they were kind of wayward. And this is where the delinquent behavior began to be recognized by people. There were kids out in the street who had nothing to do. And this is where the terms of delinquency really began to emerge. The Enlightenment perspective on youth in the 18th century was really key for especially reducing the church's control over society new philosophies about reason and emphasis on human dignity, respect, and free will began to emerge. So keep in mind, in the past, children were thought of as being born evil. 
that the reason why they engaged in criminal behavior, delinquent behavior, was the result of demonic possession. Now we're beginning to see Greek and Roman schools of thought begin to spread. And again, all has to do with Johannes Gutenberg and the printing press. It also has to do with trade. So as especially Greek and Roman countries began to learn the value of trade, the value of travel to new lands to learn from other people, but more likely to steal from other people, resulted in new ideas emerging and spreading throughout different countries that otherwise wouldn't have had any communication with each other. So we begin to see this increased focus on science over religion. We're no longer just seeing people farmland. New technologies are developing. This travel and writing down notes and recording stories basically results in the creation of literature and the creation of new ideas. So this figure is really meant to just try and show everybody how slow progress was in changing perspectives and then how quickly perspectives changed over time. So if we start sort of at 1 BC or 1 before the common era, we thought of criminal behavior or everybody believed in this idea of original sin. And then when we move through the common era, we took, you know, 100 century, 200 century, all the way up until about the 17th century, midway through the 17th century, that people began to have different perspectives on the idea of how people are innately born. So we move away from this idea of original sin. What we see in the mid 1600s is Thomas Hobbes wrote that people are born evil, but did not really believe that this evilness was the result of the Roman Catholic Church's belief in original sin. It wasn't that they were born with sin, it's just that humans were innately evil, and that's why we have these social contracts to try and stop people from moving towards their like innate evilness. Thomas Hobbes doesn't really shake things up totally, but he begins to just say that, hey, it's not just the church. Church's ideas are what we have to believe in. John Locke was very key and this happened only about 30 years later from Thomas Hobbes, but John Locke was very key in completely changing the viewpoint of people. Instead, Locke said, no, people are born neither good nor evil. They're born as a blank slate. So this huge shift from the Roman Catholic Church, huge shift from Thomas Hobbes and this idea that people are born evil. This blank slate notion becomes hugely important for contemporary criminological theories like social learning theory. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, about 10 years after Locke, said people are actually born good. And as I mentioned earlier in the class, it's that people are corrupted by society. It's society that is corrupt, and that's why people begin to involve themselves in criminal behavior. We can see these ideas influence Emile Durkheim when he was talking about anime and how the state of society is going to impact individuals' involvement in criminal behavior. We can look at more contemporary theories like Agnes strain theory where things happen to somebody and that is why they engage in criminal behavior. So this marks the big difference between control theories, which try to explain why people do not engage in criminal behavior, i.e. something happens to them to stop them from involving themselves in criminal behavior, in consensus theories. And consensus theories are those which say that people are, are basically born good or born as blank slates, and something in their environment changes in a way that influences their involvement in criminal behavior. But at the same time as Jean-Jacques Rousseau was Cesare Beccaria. And Beccaria basically said that man is calculating. They are able to perform that hedonistic calculus, balancing pleasure versus pain and they will engage in behaviors that will bring pleasure and minimize pain. And this is where fundamental principles of our current justice system are still based on. The idea that through punishment, through the codification of criminal laws, we will be able to deter individuals from engaging in crime because the rewards, i.e. the pleasure, will not outweigh the pain, i.e. the punishment. So for like 1500, 1600 years, there was a single idea. And then within the span of 
50 years, there was, or 100 years, there was now all these different perspectives. Some are saying that children are still born evil. Some are saying that children are born neutral. Others are saying that children are actually born with a sense of morality and that it's society that corrupts everyone. So keep these different ideas in mind when we're going through the different theoretical perspectives of youth offending that we talk about in this class. <laughs> Transition through the Enlightenment brings us to European settilization and what we refer to now as Canada. So we'll take a look at the Canadian context. What's important to keep in mind is that changes in Canada do not necessarily happen at the same time as changes in Western Europe. The Industrial Revolution in England didn't really take place the same time as the Industrial Revolution in Canada. Settlers in England were leaving or almost fleeing the Industrial Revolution to Canada where it was more of an agrarian society. So understand that there's a bit of a discrepancy in how we talk about different eras when we're talking about Canada versus talking about Western Europe, especially England. So when we see the first European settlers come to Canada, what we see is mainly impoverished Europeans, more people that were literally desperate to leave England and find a better home or desperate to leave France and find a better home, a better way of life. So they would sail across the Atlantic Ocean with no money, very little food. This is where the scurvy came from because people were so impoverished their teeth when things would begin to rot. That's why they were sucking on lemons or why people have been referred to as lemon suckers to try and prevent scurvy. So it's a very derogatory term referred to somebody who's literally just trying to immigrate to a new land to start a better life for them and their family. So they thought that moving to this new land would create a lot of new opportunities and experiences. And once they arrived, they realized that there was really, there was no great new opportunities. They mostly experienced sickness, unemployment, and death. It was a very hard way of living. And what became difficult is that children, because their parents died or their parents needed to travel to other places to find work, they were given this newfound freedom and independence. This was especially different from the seniorial system in France, where there was a heavy emphasis on closely monitoring the children and closely mentoring the children to well, get rid of original sin or help make sure that these wild children were tamed. There's no longer this oversight of children. In fact, children were often required to participate in the fur trade to help earn income. And this meant that they would be engaging in adult-like behaviors such as drinking. So when parents were dying or literally abandoning their children, these children were forced to take care of themselves. So they're no longer submitting to the authority of parents. They're not going to church. They're not listening to church. Instead, really what's going on is that parents are now dependent on children for their labor. And they're often not working together. They're out trapping furs. They're moving across different locations or geographic regions. So Canada's the initial settlement of Europeans to Canada was characterized by an agrarian society, which means that it's subsistence based, where family is supposed to be the essential social unit, but as we saw that this could sometimes dissipate when families died. But it was also characterized by a patriarchal societal structure, meaning that what the father says goes. Church under these agrarian societies is still very influential, very paramount. Even if we did begin to see formal governments develop, still the church was having a huge influence on government and on education. Education during agrarian societies came in the form of apprenticeships, where an individual, a child, or an adolescent would be working with somebody in a trade like carpentry, blacksmith, anything like that, and they would be learning that trade by working with that individual. So these agrarian societies were very rural based. There was no such thing as cities or even towns. People lived very, very far apart from one another 
and might only see each other during Sunday church. The distance between people under these agrarian societies is really key in terms of not recognizing the problem of delinquent or criminal behavior. People were so far away from one another that there wasn't even really an opportunity to see poverty or to see delinquent behavior. So what did agrarian societies in Canada look like? So looking before 1867, 1867 being when Canada became officially a country. So people lived in very small rural areas dependent on farming resources, basically required extraction from the land, which were to earn a livelihood, so physical labor was paramount. This is a cotton field sort of in the United States, but what it does is it shows kind of how children lived in this agrarian society where they're maybe not even attending school, they are working in the fields with family. Post-Confederation in Canada, we begin to see a shift towards an industrial society where it's production-based. So goods are being produced not for the family unit or not for sale at particular markets, but for like wholesale sale. The nuclear family is still really important at this time. Patriarchal societal structures still exist. And the church continues to have some influence, but that influence is declining, especially in terms of a direct influence. It's no longer, like there are no longer schools run solely by the church. Because of the need to operate machinery, we see the need for specialized skills and training. And remember, this training often requires the ability to understand and retain complex information or even the ability to read. I'm not saying that having kids work in fields for 18 hours a day, 16 hours a day, 12 hours a day, whatever was a good thing, but what it did do was give them something to do something to work at and be under the supervision of adults. I'm not saying that children didn't work in these factories, but it took some time before they could be working in these factories. And what that meant was that they could be out in the streets or unmonitored by parents at that time. We also begin to see the creation of cities. The geographical regions become more urban, more condensed. And this is where people begin to recognize poverty and recognize delinquency. When they were living so far apart, these things weren't recognized. Furthermore, and I'll talk about this later, but we begin to see 24-hour industries, where factories could be open the entire day, the entire night. Prior to this, working on farms when there's no electricity, things would shut down after five, six, seven o'clock. And what this means is that people were not out and about as often. They would leave the farm and they would be confined to their homes. Now we see people out at all hours of the day, all hours of the night, and people begin to witness what's actually going on outside of daylight hours and beginning to realize that there's crime, that there is delinquent behavior going on. During these industrial societies, we also saw an influx of immigration from countries other than England, so Italy, Poland, Germany, we begin to see new persons with different cultures all beginning to come and live within the same geographic region. The influx of people from these different countries actually led to a work shortage, which I, what I mean by that is like there was a lot of unemployment because there was not enough work to meet the uh, influx of people coming from different countries. Once again, just like the agrarian societies, we see a failure to distinguish really between children and adults. Here we see kids working in coal mines dressed like adults doing the same type of job as adults. Similarly, again, it took some time for kids to move into factories, but once they did, they were treated just like adults. You can see a girl here standing on like a, a soapbox or something like that to be able to reach the sewing machine. So they're doing the exact same type of job as adults. There were some fairly major consequences to children that came from industrialization. So one was that families were deserted. Children were brought over, like they were even sent from Europe to Canada specifically to work. And they were taken advantage of by employers. This created an industry of prostitution in Canada. We saw social conditions result in the decrease of legal rights for young persons. So there was no like social safety net in the settling of Canada 
by Europeans. There was no like government, there were no clear court system, though there were kangaroo courts. So it was very easy to take advantage of children during this time, especially because there was not necessarily any parents looking out to monitor or watch out for them. So many social reformers saw the causes of juvenile crime as being of the result of immorality. So there was nobody there to teach them the right types of behaviors. So this is what led to the creation of reformatory schools where children were housed in these like orphanages or group homes so that they could be taught moral behavior. So this delinquent behavior was a social welfare problem. These individuals were living in poverty as a result of the loss of agrarian roots. And here's where we see the, like, the classic, our generation was never this bad mindset. And we, we see this throughout history. The, the older generation always thinks that the newer generation is in some way worse than them. The response to the industrial problem came from Victorian morality, sometimes referred to as child savers, where they saw children on the street begging and stealing. They were, these children were referred to as waifs or strays, and they were there because of like, destitution, a lack of employment opportunities, and really severe living conditions. So it was really a bad system for kids to be in. And instead of understanding that the system was the problem, these child savers believed that these kids had a moral problem. It wasn't that they were impoverished. It was they were immoral and maybe that was why they were impoverished. That was why they were gambling or engaging in prostitution. We see a f fundamental neglect of the broader social structure that is influencing behavior and instead an almost entire focus on the individual and belief that this individual is immoral. We still see the Victorian morality, especially from Protestant perspectives, the idea of thou shalt shall not steal. And therefore, if somebody is stealing, you, you can't use poverty as a justification to steal. It's a sin. And so this sin needs to be dealt with by training kids or training children. And this is where the idea of training schools developed. They developed, especially as I mentioned, because urbanization means that crime is now much more visible. Child labor laws at the time meant that kids were not actually allowed to work in these factories. So while that might sound like a good thing, not subjecting kids to 16 hour days working in dangerous conditions, it also left them impoverished. They didn't have an opportunity to get a job, especially if they were orphaned, they're living on the street or they're living in, you know, like the aisles of a church or anything like that. And so instead of recognizing the poverty problem, again, the focus was on the child having done something wrong. And that is what needs to be corrected, not the system that they're a part of. In Canada in the late 19th century, early 20th century, we begin to see a transition toward social reform and a social welfare movement, which included paying of taxes and the developing of this social safety net. So a way to uh, not just rely on private charity if somebody falls ill or if they're unable to work because of like a workplace accident or anything like that, which would sometimes force kids to work to support their family. Instead, this social welfare approach begins, you know, we need to have these social safety nets, these social systems that allow us to help individuals that are in need and improve working conditions. So this social reform included creating legislation that limited the severity of criminal law. So limited the types of punishments that could be handed out and actually began to recognize the special status of children. <laughs> to youth crime recognized that children and adolescents were different from adults but did not actually separate the criminal justice system as a youth system and adult system it was all dealt with under the same umbrella so that's the the situation in canada in the 19th 
we're in the 20th century, but let's just sort of pull back for a second and get an understanding of how youth justice has worked over time. So pre-enlightenment, so think medieval era and onwards, children were treated as miniature adults. So there was no need to even begin to think about a separate justice system or responding to children differently from adults. As we see maybe towards the enlightenment, especially when we begin to see the spreading of new ideas, we begin to see this idea of patria posteritas, which means that the father had absolute control over the child. So this was a transition from the focus on the church having control to the more patriarchal social structures that we've seen for the last couple hundred years, where children were the possessions of the father. The family unit was the possession of the father. So there was no need for a separate youth justice system or anything like that because the father was responsible, but was beginning to recognize that given the father is responsible for this person, maybe it does mean that we're thinking about youth differently, that the individual is being raised, mentored, trained by the father because they are distinctly different from adults in terms of their development. We then begin to see the principle of parens patriae, which is this idea that when the father is not able to take responsibility of the child, the king or the state will assume responsibility for this individual. All the people living within a country or a particular region or a particular state represent the responsibility of the person ruling over that region. So what this means is the courts would take responsibility of the child if parents died or if parents were deemed unfit to raise this child. So still there was no distinct youth justice system, but there was a recognition that courts were required or mandated under this principle of parents patriae to begin to look out for children, to try and identify what is in the best interests of the child, and then enact specific legislation or specific laws that will look over the child. We also saw during this time transitions in terms of what it means to engage in criminal behavior. So we've definitely through enlightenment and especially through Cesare Beccaria's idea of criminal behavior as being a choice or man as being a rational actor, we begin to recognize that, okay, there's going to be a hedonistic calculus going on we need to be able to tell people that they would be punished for something. That way they are actually able to develop that rational calculus. Laws begin to become codified. So a crime is something that's an intentional contravention of something that is punished by the state. And this separates acts uh, that are accidental from acts of malice that are actually purposeful. So we begin to get this idea of mens rea, the guilty mind, that somebody has to be culpable or blameworthy for their actions. And that began to raise the question of, are young people actually able to form criminal intent? Are they able to form the mens rea? At what age does somebody begin to have the understanding that their behavior is wrong and therefore they can be held responsible for their actions? In contemporary criminal justice systems in Canada, age 12 is set as the age of criminal responsibility or the age at which someone can form mens rea. The reality actually though is that individuals probably begin to show this understanding of criminal behavior at an earlier age. And we'll take a look for our tutorial discussion this week at a video of individuals who committed a homicide offense before age 12 and I'll ask you to reflect on how you think they do or do not have mens rea. The dark cloud of one of the worst crimes in British history still hangs over Liverpool like a shroud. Only now, the anger is back as well. Welcome to the programme. It's the evening show and, of course, tonight we are talking about Venables. The amount of money that is being spent on protecting this scumbag who has done what he's done. I think that they should have been named and told where they are. They're like the devil's child of both them. The collective memory of a nation has gone back to that February day 17 years ago. The horrifying freeze frame 
when two-year-old James Bolger was lured to his death. A murder made so sickening because the killers were children themselves. Robert Thompson and John Venables were just 10. And much to the nation's outrage, they were free again by the age of 18. It's an awful thing to say. It's an awful thing to say on television. They've had a taste of blood. And I, I, I believe they will never change. In practical terms, Thompson and Venables don't exist anymore. After eight years of therapy and rehabilitation, the authorities gave them new identities. The boys were set free with different names, different cover stories to allow them to lead normal lives. But they're not boys any longer. And at 27, John Venables is charged with a new and grotesque crime, downloading and distributing child pornography. It means the controversy over how two child murderers got off so lightly is exploding all over again. Despite all the work that was done to, to try and rehabilitate them back into society, it's obviously failed and it looks as if there have been some serious failings. Detective Superintendent Albert Kirby headed the Bolger murder investigation. Tonight, he'll reveal an aspect of the case that was suppressed at the time, that shows what a truly evil act it was, and makes you wonder if what's happening now was inevitable. Why didn't they identify the behavioural problems before it came to this? Are you surprised that he's offended again? If I was to be asked prior to all this which boy was going to be reoffend, it would not have been Venables. I was bitterly disappointed when I found out it was him. When you go out in public any time like this, do you ever look at people and think, you know, it could be him, it could be him? In the beginning of the chair for not anymore. Denise Fergus, James Bolger's mum, and her husband Stuart believe this wouldn't be happening if the child killers were punished properly, rather than getting just eight years in detention. They got no punishment whatsoever. They got rewards for murder and James. That's why I've never let it go and I won't let it go. You think they were rewarded? Of course it was a reward because they never spent no time in a prison. They got put into a, a children's home and from their release in children's home, they get looked after, they get to play snooker tables, decent meals in front of them. Uh, they were getting day trips out, taken to football matches. You know, that, that is not punishment. I think some very, very serious questions need to be asked here, Peter. Yeah, I agree with you, Leslie. And many people, including Liverpool talk show host Peter Price, believe that special treatment is continuing now. It's just unbelievable for me, you know what I mean? Yeah. Even with Venables facing child pornography charges. This has been an absolute disaster. They've never been punished, in my humble opinion for what they've done. They should have gone to prison. They shouldn't have been mollycoddled and protected the way they were protected. Remember, a baby was tortured and slaughtered. The anger still runs deep because everyone here remembers what a calculated and brutal murder it was. Instead of going to school, Venables and Thompson came here to the Strand Shopping Centre actually looking for a child to kill. At around midday, they tried to lure another toddler outside into the traffic, but that failed. Then they spotted James Bolger. As his mum stood at the butcher shop counter, they enticed little Jamie at just the right moment. It was just so, so quick. As I say, I just reached out for my purse to pay money over the counter. And he was there, and when I turned out, he'd gone. That's how quick it happened. So in the time it took to take the money out of your purse... He'd gone. All the shopping precinct is covered by CCTV. And I think some of the iconic pictures were of Thompson and Venables holding James's hand, walking away. That's we Venables think, holding his hand? Yeah. And then they're outside the shopping centre in, in probably just under two minutes. It was that quick. They knew exactly where they were going to. They were going to commit murder. They walked James along a canal and through the back alleys of Liverpool to avoid being spotted. In two hours, they covered four kilometres, a huge journey for a terrified and exhausted two-year-old. Finally, to a railway line. 
and there they threw rocks and bricks at James, beat him with an iron bar, interfered with him in a sexual way, and left him on the tracks where he was later run over by a train. If you could see the severity of what they did to James on the railway line, it, it was grotesque to the extreme. Um, they knew what they were doing to that little boy. The sexual nature of James's killing was never publicly revealed. But Superintendent Kirby believes it should have been given greater consideration in sentencing and rehabilitating Thompson and Venables. There was always a very serious concern in my mind over the sexual element over James's murder. I, f I, I feel that that may not have been treated with the severity that it should have been. I think the, the bigger impact has been to ensure that they were released within the time frame that had been set by the courts. And that has detracted from the real treatment that they should have gone through. Even now, after all this time, 17 years, there's no doubt in your mind that it wasn't just a prank gone wrong, it was evil. Yes, uh, uh, there's no doubt in my mind at all. It was complete evil intent. I think they'd got a hot potato and just didn't know what to do after a while and how to get rid of him. And, and tragically, um, the, the rest of history, they had took him up to the railway. Given the level of anger, Lawrence Lee is a brave man. One of the few in Britain who, to this day, dares defend the boys. He was John Venable's lawyer. Are you telling me it wasn't premeditated, that they didn't intend to kill James Bulger? I think that they wanted to take this little boy for a, for a laugh, as it were, and having taken him, couldn't give him back, and they just didn't know what to do, and the logic of a 10-year-old's, unfortunately, evil 10-year-old's, as it turned out, um, dictated that they dealt with him in a, in a way totally different than uh, should have been. You sound as though you still have some sympathy for Venables. I don't have any sympathy whatsoever uh, as a result of what they did. I am putting forward purely and simply legal argument, talking like a lawyer. The 10-year-olds faced furious crowds at the Liverpool court. And behind the scenes, their lawyer worried they'd never get a fair trial. And I looked out the window and I saw this baying mob and I could see the bricks being thrown. It was just unbelievable. The rallying cry was lock them up and throw away the key. But the judge ruled that rehabilitation while in detention was the sensible sentence. Both were found equally culpable. Though police and lawyers agreed, Thompson was the ringleader and Venables the nicer of the two. Throughout the trial, he was respectful, polite, remorseful, and he had a bad time in court. He, he really did suffer, unlike Thompson, who didn't seem to show any remorse. He's one of the few kids of that age who, for example, bought me a birthday present. You know, I mean, that's only a little thing, but, it, you know, it shows that he cared. Because they were babies themselves, these callous killers received special privileges. There are stories of seaside visits and trips to football matches to prepare for their release. Safeguarding and rehabilitating them cost the British taxpayer millions of pounds. And it's likely Venables will need another new identity after he faces these new charges. People are shaking their heads in disbelief because he's had the best of the best to help him. And if he hasn't learned from all the mollycoddling and help he's had and professionals that have been looking after him, then we have created a monster. If you've got me, baby, just come back. James's mum, on the other hand, has received no help, apart from an outpouring of public sympathy. This case has always been one side. It's, it's always been, what about Venables? What about Thompson? What about me and what about my family? What about my kids? To add insult to injury, it was reported that after his release, Venables made return visits to Liverpool to walk the streets of the town he's so horrified. 
Denise has been told he was a heavy drinker, prone to violence, and was seen boozing and chatting up young girls in local pubs. Oh God, it just doesn't even bear to think about. Isn't one of the parole conditions that he's not allowed to come to Liverpool? Well, that was the agreement, but as I say, the allegations that he has been coming to Liverpool and he's certainly not allowed to come near me or my family. How do I know he hasn't been to my sister's house with her daughter or, you know, my brother's house with his daughter? I just don't know. Venable's re-arrest has British authorities questioning the entire handling of the Bolger case. I think the sentence was far too low. I think it was too low not only for punishment purposes, but also to be assured that they could actually make that integration back into society. They should be incarcerated without any shadow of a doubt. They never have been. What, just throw Thompson back in jail too? If it is proved that Venables has, in fact, um, been found guilty of these hideous crimes, um, it's just touching on something that could be even more sinister and I think they should go back and revisit the case and maybe see if there's any evidence to prove that both of them were involved in something far more sinister. So now we need to go back to Canada and look at Canada's perspective on crime. What were the causes of crime according to Canada during agrarian societies? The main one was the fur trade and then tangentially we'll Related to the fur trade was the consumption of alcohol. That, so the fur trade kind of had two main consequences that linked to criminal behavior. One was that kids were taking on these adult roles and engaging in adult behaviors like drinking and that this was leading to their criminal behavior. The other was that now during the fur trade, these kids have too much freedom. They're off on their own. No longer do we see that apprenticeship, mentorship relationship. When Canada shifted to an industrial society, the main causes of youth crime were viewed to be poverty, homelessness, and the lack of family. But keep in mind, these weren't used as the explanations for why kids were involved in crime. It was more like kids were involved in crime because they were immoral as a result of poverty, homelessness, and the lack of family. So the cause of crime is this immorality. They are recognizing that if we improve their poverty, improve their homelessness, improve their lack of family, maybe that will teach them a sense of morals. The Industrial Revolution was so important because it created youth crime, but it also created exposure to youth crime. So we saw substantial increases in youth crime during the Industrial Revolution in Canada and also the United States, where we see upticks in property offenses, especially as a result of needing to steal food, steal items to basically live. Some times we saw increases in violent crime as we saw ethnic-centric gangs uh, become more common. So with influxes in immigration, we didn't see necessarily this melting pot where everybody lived in the same areas, went to the same churches, and so on. Instead, we saw that there were Irish-based gangs or Polish-based gangs or Italian-based gangs, and they would settle in specific neighborhoods. So we saw this especially in the United States where there's these ethnocentric neighborhoods as well. And this is what led to the creation of ethnocentric gangs. In the graph that you see here, we're seeing one of the first theoretical perspectives on criminal behavior at a macro level. So what this means, a macro level explanation of crime is trying to explain why crime rates or why crime is higher in some neighborhoods but not others. Micro level explanations focus on like the individual or their social environment, why that particular person engages in criminal behavior. But macro level perspectives are focusing on like neighborhoods or cities or countries. So what we see here is coming from the Chicago School of Crime and their perspective was that we have in all major urban areas a zone in transition which is right next to this industrial area, the heart of the city. And people living in this zone in transition are people that are working in these factories and need to get to these factories relatively efficiently. So people who are living in this zone in transition, they are very much 
living in poverty. They are renting places. They're moving in and out of these areas. There's a lack of stable or res stable living, or what we would refer to as residential mobility. So this high turnover in where people are living means that there's not really a sense of community. And this lack of a sense of community can influence why people might engage in property offenses because they don't know their neighbor, things like that. At the beginning of the lecture, I played a song by Master Ace that talks about Cabrini Green in Chicago. It was built in 1942. It started out sort of as this cluster of Italian shanties and then became home to approximately 15,000 black Americans. In Canada, we don't really have this type of neighborhood structure. In some ways, we have this in Toronto in the Jane Finch area. This was more so a US-based phenomenon of these highly dense clusters of apartment buildings. In the United States, this is a particularly important phenomenon. This, like, this idea of neighborhood-based poverty is important because municipal services are heavily dependent on tax dollars. So the working class whose jobs have now left them behind are not really contributing much to these, to, like they don't pay much in taxes. So that means that in those neighborhoods, there isn't as much money for police. There isn't as much money for fire departments, for healthcare, for education. So this is really problematic because what it's saying is that once the middle upper class left these neighborhoods, so too did their paying of tax dollars. So now the underfunded schools are in the areas that are most in need of school funding. So this further creates this, this is why we talk about systemic disadvantage in the United States, but also elsewhere, but especially in the United States, is that tax dollars are kind of stratified by neighborhood. In BC, we have a plethora of public schools and these public schools are funded by all of BC tax dollars. In the United States, it's really different in terms of the tax dollars funding this school come only from the people living in that neighborhood or that region that that school operates in. That's what continues to drive sort of disadvantage and oppression. So what was Canada's response to youth crime? Basically during the 1800s, Canadian Parliament passed laws to say that children under the age of seven were considered doly incapacitated, meaning that they were incapable of crime, almost like saying that they were not criminally responsible for their behavior. Children between ages seven to 13 were considered prima facie, so presumptively presumed incapable of crime. But this presumption could be rebutted by Crown Council in special circumstances. So if the 12 year old seemed like they were clearly responsible for criminal behavior, then it was up to the prosecution to show that that was the case. Children from ages 14 onwards were considered fully responsible for their crimes and all children were dealt with through the adult justice system. So they didn't even call it an adult justice system at the time, it was just the justice system. There was no separation of youth and adults. Although there wasn't a separate justice system, people began to think about youth crime as different from adult crime and began to think that responses to youth crime needed to be different. And there were two main but different philosophical approaches. The first was the youth advocate approach, which was interested in the problems experienced by young people, the welfare of the young person. They felt that media is exaggerating or misrepresents youth crime and we need policies to address impoverishment and unemployment. On the other hand, law and order advocates viewed youth crime as out of control, that individuals who were youth were disproportionately involved in violent crime, and this was because they lacked respect for other people, they lacked morals, and we needed these get tough policies to deter youth crime. During Canada's Industrial Revolution, the response to youth crime was about removing them from their social environment or from the community that they were a part of. So how did Canada develop a response to youth crime or to crime in general for that matter? Really what we see is a blend of two sources of information. We see Canada developing both a common law approach, which is, the England, which is England's approach, 
and the Napoleonic law approach or the Roman law approach. The common law approach is based on precedent. What this means is that how an individual is punished for a particular behavior is based on how similar individuals committing similar crimes were punished for that particular behavior. So we see specific precedents that have been set or sorry. So we see if we review Supreme Court Canada decisions, these are what dictate precedent. This is the common law approach. The Napoleonic law approach or the Roman law approach is about having codified principles. So this is where we see the Canadian criminal code come to play. The criminal code actually dictates what is and is not a crime, but also how an individual should be punished for a particular crime. So whether this is going to be an indictable offense, where the individual can receive a sentence of two or more years in custody, or a summary offense, or a hybrid offense, which can be preceded summarily or indictable depending on the aggravating circumstances. Some of our criminal codes have specific mandatory minimums that dictate the minimum sentence that an individual can receive. That's how Canada has this blend of Napoleonic law that gives us sort of instructions to judges about the boundaries of what a person can receive in terms of the sentence. And then common law helps them narrow down on what type of sentence an individual should receive, but it has to be within those boundaries of the criminal code. So removing kids from the community meant creating these houses of refuge where we had Quakers and where the term Quaker comes from is literally the idea about the religion that people close to God would begin to shake or quake and that's why they were called Quakers, marked a shift in the emphasis from family-centered discipline to if the family isn't there, we're going to adopt that parens patriotic principle and it's now the young person is under the control or the purview of the state. The idea here was that adults were corrupting youth and we need to keep them separate from adults and focus on hard work and discipline. Most juvenile institutions took on the characteristics of adult prisons, however. So there was this goal of separating youth from adults and that kind of work, but the youth system and the adult system were quite similar in terms of horrific conditions and abuse. These institutions were characterized by underfunding, high rates of escape, chronic mismanagement, and a general lack of progress in the sense that they didn't actually seem to be helping youth whatsoever. From houses of refuge came reformatories in the mid 19th century where the goal was to try and teach youth basic skills like how to read and write that would allow them to enter the job market upon their release. What some believed was happening though was that these reformatories became schools of crime where it was an opportunity for orphaned youth to meet other like-minded youth who would then once released into the community form a gang and continue to commit crime together. These reform schools often weren't targeting individuals because of their criminal or delinquent behavior, but actually because of their poverty. So it was really a good example of poverty being criminalized. And you can still see, especially in the United States, examples of this, where individuals in the United States who get sent to jail are actually required to pay for their jailing. So the privatized prison requires an individual to pay a fee each day for living in this prison. And when they get out into the community, their failure to pay back what they owe can result in reincarceration. So that's a more contemporary example. Canada had examples of this where an individual was labeled delinquent because they were impoverished because they were being neglected by parents or because they were sort of this living a life of vagrancy and moving from place to place. It wasn't so much that they were necessarily stealing or committing crimes, but they were punished for their poverty. And this was very much a religious divide that I alluded to at the beginning of lecture, where it was Catholic immigrants versus Protestant institutions, where Protestant institutions were targeting Catholic children to make these children more like 
our children. So the goal was cultural reform or religious reform and not just behavioral reform. So the new immigrants most vulnerable to poverty were the ones who were also most vulnerable to institutionalization. And I talked about the child saving movement earlier and these were really like the first examples of youth advocates. And while they may have been well intentioned, their good intentions very often led to worse circumstances for youth. The child saving movement of the 19th century, especially the late 19th century, emphasized traditional values and hard work, and not all child savers were bad people. John Joseph Kelso, who was one of the pioneers of the child saving movement in Canada, was very much focused on humanitarian efforts, but not all individuals shared this belief. And the idea was that we just need to make these children look more like how we believe people should behave even if this behavior wasn't necessarily focused on criminal or delinquent behavior. So what did happen though was the term juvenile delinquent actually became a legal status. So it wasn't just a label of behavior, it was the courts labeling someone as delinquent and this delinquent status meant that they could be held in a reformatory school indefinitely. This juvenile delinquent legal status then served as the basis for Canada's first juvenile justice system. So this juvenile delinquent will be dealt with separately in a youth system as opposed to an adult system. So the child savers movement, because they wanted to keep youth separate from adults, because they were worried that adults would corrupt youth, really were the ones responsible for creating a youth justice system. So what were some of the principles of the child savers movement? Really, they believed that parents needed to teach morality to children, and so orphan children needed the state to come in and teach them morality. Or they would view parents as deficient in their parenting style if those parents were not parenting in a way that conformed to more Protestant norms. So we see a massive shift uh, like back in the day, children interacted socially with adults. They were mentored by adults. Now we're seeing children and adults being very much separate in society and not just in the justice system. So it was much different from the autonomy of the fur trade as well. The idea was that if we can manage these children in reform schools, then they're going to change. Basically, the child savers movement was an era where we saw a collision of culture, where middle class Protestant women in positions of, of power or their ability to espouse their own values were sort of doing this towards underclass immigrants who were more likely to value things like autonomy, physicality, and spontaneity. This meant no longer housing youth with adults, it meant that children needed to be guided and protected, and that improper parenting was blamed. Neglectful and immoral parents were now responsible for why their children were maybe immoral or engaging in petty theft or delinquency. So this marked a shift from fur trade perspectives where it was a belief in like a lack of discipline and a loss of authority. Now it was believed that there was authority folks in place but they weren't doing a sufficient job. As I mentioned, not all reformers or child savers were the same. John Joseph Kelso disagreed with reformatories, for example, and the child savers movement might have unfairly penalized children and youth, especially those from a minority status. So the child savers movement really failed to distinguish between neglected and delinquent children. Neglected children were treated the same way as somebody who engaged in a crime. Some also believe that the child savers movements or child savers were acting in the best interests of the youth, but this sometimes led to harsher punishment for youth. So youth were being punished more severely than what an adult would have been punished if they were processed in the adult court system. <laughs>
from the 14th to the 16th century, we begin to see a movement away from serfdom. So people begin to own their own plots of land as opposed to living on the land of a lord and farming for the purposes of the lord's own financial gain, for example. This was the time of agrarian societies where people were farming specifically to feed themselves. Church is no longer the department of justice. It's no longer actually the one doling out the punishment, but it's still very much influencing how people view crime, still having a very large influence on society more broadly. That was more until the 17th and 18th century after the periods of enlightenment where we begin to see new ideas not associated with the church take hold. So that hegemonic control of the church has really dissipated at this point and capitalism becomes a new emerging concept where no longer is it this idea that an individual works for what they need or that only the government can run these state controlled businesses. Now anybody can create their own industry, their own small business. So this all led to the convergence of new views on the causes of crime, not just moving away from original sin or demonic possession, but recognizing, okay, so maybe some individuals engage in crime because of a lack of morals or they were never taught things and their things never happened to them to teach them that crime was wrong. Others begin to say, no, people are engaging in crime because of strain, because of poverty. Others are saying, no, people are engaging in crime because our punishment is not harsh enough. So it's this complexity of viewpoints that really characterize the emergence of the 17th, 18th century in Canada. The 19th and 20th century, where we witness the Industrial Revolution, we begin to see the separation of youth and adults. We see that their youth are characterized by living in poor working conditions, and some felt that child labor laws should be developed to protect youth from these conditions. And while that was helpful, it also pushed youth out of factories where they were making money and into the streets. And so now youth crime and delinquency is very visible. People tended to neglect it when it wasn't something that they had to walk past to get to the bank or get to the market. Now that they're seeing these problems, they want to respond to them. They have the youth's best interests in mind, but it's not necessarily listening to what the youth wants. It's what they believe is in the youth's best interest, and that is to have this Protestant ethic where you're not wild, you're not reckless, you're very subdued in your behavior. This was all according to persons from the Child Savers movement. So to summarize some of these key, so to summarize some of these key themes, we have different historical perspectives, that medieval perspective, the Reformation perspective, the Enlightenment perspective, the shift to agrarian societies, and the shift to industrial societies. And all of, these pers all of these viewpoints had different perspectives on youth or didn't even consider youth at all. And also had different perspectives on the causes of youth crime and delinquency. The Industrial Revolution brought crime into those urban centers. And now juvenile delinquency is much more in the open. The role of Child Savers Movement was to develop reform schools to try and correct this behavior based on the belief that the parents of these youth were not doing a sufficient job. So next week we'll begin to look more deeply at theories surrounding why individuals or why youth engaged in crime in the first place.